Man, I tell you, many times I've said how much I love the ocean, getting down, and uh, I love Newport, Oregon, Vancouver Island's uh, west coast. Uh, this is in uh, Olympic Peninsula, Washington, and we're on the northern part of it. Absolutely beautiful day. We're at the coast. You can listen to the birds singing. And the car door alarm going off, but it's the perfect day. Except for we're not in a perfect world. Right now I came across an article about Cassini's auklets, which are a small seabird, and they're starving to death on the Pacific coast. Scientists are trying to figure out what's behind the mass die-off of the small white-bellied gray birds known as Cassini's auklets. And this die-off is reported from British Columbia to California. It's not just in one area. As a matter of fact, if you Google Pacific Coast seabird die-off, puzzle scientists, you're going to get dozens of articles that it's puzzling scientists. Oh man, what could it be? Why could these little birds be dying off? I have no idea. But it's a tragedy unfolding and sad to say that, uh, you know, I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist or a biologist to figure out what's killing our oceans because for a long time, we have been using our oceans as a garbage dump. We're dumping sewage in there all across the world, it doesn't matter if it's in North America, South America, Asia, wherever. We use the ocean as a large dumping ground. And on top of that, we have also as unsustainable fishing practices. They're scraping the bottom of the sea now, catching fish that a few years ago they wouldn't have touched. Everything is being taken. And then we have chemical pollutants. We have uh, runoff from agriculture getting into the oceans. All these things are poisoning the ocean. And on top of that, if that's not enough, well, all this carbon in the atmosphere mixes with rain when it falls, and it's called acid rain. And it's making the oceans acidy. It's a wonder that any of the life has any hope of survival. Not only in the oceans, but even on land. Everything is connected. It's all connected. And it's hard to imagine how much dependence we have on birds birds i mean you know, i've made videos talking about pollinators and that we need the pollinators but birds are there eating the seeds and they fly around and when they poop putting it mildly the seeds quite often fall to the ground germinate and they grow into new plants it spreads it around naturally that's how it's been for eons in our history For millions of years this has been going on, and for thousands of years, before all the technology we had, we coexisted with the oceans. People were fishing, but using methods that didn't deplete stocks. Today there's no thought about depletion, it's about get as much as you can when you get it before it's gone. And this has led to tremendous declines in many fish and other species in the ocean and you got to think about how everything is connected like you know they're saying that the little birds are starving well if they eat little fish maybe the little fish are missing because maybe something has killed the plankton there could be pollutants in the water killing plankton and by the way some of the biggest creatures in our oceans depend on plankton like whale sharks and stuff like that but if the plankton are gone, the little fish are not getting their food, so the little fish are gone. Everything is connected. It's not rocket science. But we don't seem to appreciate that or understand it. These are all along the Pacific coast of Olympic Peninsula, Washington State, and uh, the colorful birds. I mean, Cindy and I love to film birds, and even in the interior of British Columbia and interior of the United States, many species are in a huge decline. But they're not alone. We're screwing up the whole planet. British Columbia, Oregon, and many other parts of the Pacific coast have oyster farms. This is again Olympic Peninsula. 
generations have depended on making a living from the sea. Happens around the world, but these generations are not going to be able to do it much longer. Mystery surrounds massive die-off of oysters and scallops. High acidity is being blamed for massive die-off of BC scallops. 10 million scallops, that's about 16% of BC's production, has gone. But it's not just British Columbia. Northwest oyster die-off show ocean acidification has arrived. Our oceans are acidy. Jeez, what could that mean? I mean, what could that mean for the oceans? If they're acidy now, and we keep pumping carbon in the atmosphere, which keeps falling as acid rain, what do you think it's going to be like in another 10, 30, 50, 100 years? What's going to happen to the life in the oceans? Apparently what the scientists are saying, that the problem with the oysters is that when they're just starting out life, they have very soft shells, and that's being destroyed by the acid in the seawater. And therefore they can't grow. They die. They die. I wish news and the media could pay more attention to what's happening on our world because this is going to impact every single person, not just now, but even generations that are being born will be feeling the impact of what we are doing to the oceans, what we are doing to the land, what we're doing to the air. Today in British, well not just British Columbia, in Canada, the biggest focus on news today on the 6th of January 2015 has to do with Canada winning the gold medal in the junior hockey tournament. And this summer we're going to have the Pan Am Games. Sports get an unbelievable amount of attention in the media. Almost reminds me of the way it was back in the days like in Rome, you know, when uh, the Caesars were losing control of their people, so they built the big coliseums and had all the sporting events that kept people occupied and distracted. It almost seems to me like that sports has become the big distractor from the realities of the world, because who really wants to pay attention to what's happening to the environment? I mean, that's so depressing. I think you're better off just cheering for a team. And in the United States, in Congress, it's driven by lobbyist money. Well, today, as uh, the new Congress convenes, well, it's going to be the XL Keystone Pipeline. Because we can never have too much carbon uh, energy, oil, dirty Alberta tar sands oil, coming through the United States over aquifers, heading to some offshore place at a time when oil already is in a glut. But we're told that we're going to need it one day. Well, not we. The world's going to need it. Get down to the seaside. And as the tide goes out, you can see starfish along the shore. What an amazing creature the starfish is. Because think about it. They live underwater. But when the tide recedes, they've learned to survive outside of it. Until the next tide comes in. Not only do they survive, but they get their food. As the tide goes in and out, it washes food to them. Now, of course, we've already heard about ocean acidification and its impact on life. Well, guess what's been happening to starfish in the last few years? Massive starfish die-off in Pacific Ocean linked to mystery virus. All these mystery viruses, you know, the puzzle scientists, like, what's with that? Starfish are dying by the millions up and down the West Coast in one of the largest wildlife die-offs ever recorded in the world's oceans. Millions of starfish off California and the West Coast have been killed. This is happening along British Columbia, Oregon, Alaska, all over. I believe it's happening all the way into the uh, South American coast also. We are killing our oceans and ultimately that's going to have repercussions for man. I mean, I'm sure already has. 
people have lost jobs. We're overfishing. The uh, scallop industry, oysters, all these things. But it's not just this kind of repercussion we've got to keep in mind. You have to think about man's survival. And not just today. I mean, if we can't protect the oceans today, what's it going to leave for two or three hundred years down the road? Our tide today was 703, I think. So, um, yeah, at six o'clock would have been perfect. Yeah. Do you ever get any octopus or anything else found we in here? We do occasionally. Um, in 10 years that I've worked here, I have yet to see one. Okay. Um, I have coworkers that have witnessed them, but it's pretty rare. So how high does the water run? Vertical line generally is your high tide mark. Okay. So how much time do we have to swim? Now that's a whole different realm because everything depends on what's happening out there. So there are going to be days where it takes forever for it to come in and then for instance right now we've got really nice surging. This could fill up in the next 45 minutes. It could take 15 or it could take two hours to get all the way up to the cobbles. It just varies. Everything is so unpredictable. <laughs> I mean, we can give you an average. Uh, right now, you have at least a half an hour. What are these things that look like green and fluffy donuts? These are anemones. They're a soft bodied animal and they're opportunistic eaters, which means that whatever is going to get trapped in their tentacles. Um, then they have a neurotoxin on each tentacle that sting a fish or crab and then they wrap its mouth, which if you can see clearly here, mm -hmm. kind of looks like a little belly button. That's its mouth and also its anus. So food comes in, processed, and then it's expelled out once the nutrients are absorbed. It's amazing. What else would we expect to see besides the sea stars and the anemones? Um, you might be able to find crabs. some German crabs right there. Ah, <laughs> um, this guy, no, it's a little periwinkle. Um, you can try looking for sea slugs, which um, really? here are really pretty. Some yeah. of their bodies into strange, chaining shapes. Um, and that's just because they're soft bodied and water is, you know, following the route of gravity. The other thing are chitons, which are kind of like snails. And there are these guys right here. And chitons have eight overlapping plates. So there's two varieties here. Here's another one. So this is the leather, or they, so they scrape off diatoms and algae with a really sharp tongue. They look prehistoric. They do. And then when they become detached, they roll up like a roly poly to protect that soft underside. Have you noticed any tsunami debris washing up yet? We have tsunami debris. Um, our, it'd be in areas such as Crescent Beach, a little bit further yeah. north, or a little bit further south. Anywhere there's protected coves, we'll get debris. Occasionally we get debris washed in the tide right. pools, but we haven't seen a dramatic influx of it. That's excellent. Hope. Yeah, hope, yeah. Is it I really dislike people who say, who cares about two or three hundred years down the road? You know, we got to live for today. We need jobs today. We need the economy today. Hell with the future. That, that, I mean, I can't believe that there are people out there who take that attitude. But I ask anyone out there, what do you think that world, our planet, is going to be like in two or three hundred years? Should man survive? Should we survive that long? And talking about survival, do you know that the killer whales, orcas, are dying along the west coast? Another species on the brink. You'll see children. So, you know, safe touching, especially these guys for aquariums. But our sea stars, they're not harmed by it as long as somebody doesn't try to pry them off. These guys can live to be about 30, 35 years, this particular species. And they get quite large. It's amazing. Plus, part of their adaptation, we were talking about how the anemones hold in. They do too. They bring in water right. and they hold it. And you can tell where gravity has shifted the water from the upper extremities right. into the Same. lower, so they're more bloated here. <laughs> that makes sense. Are they Imagine a time 
when our oceans will have very little, if any, life in them. I don't think that's hard to do today. If you do look two or three hundred years ahead, I really don't think with the conservation efforts that we're doing today that we can say that we will save the oceans, we'll save the air, we'll save the land, and ultimately that we're going to save humanity. If we continue at the rate we're going, extinction is inevitable.